first of all, appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and, and the time. Um, so we have a little bit of an eclectic grouping of things to talk about, um, mainly because, I think we put this together, mainly because um, we're kind of at that awkward period of time where some things are coming out of Washington and then we're about to enter the season of all the proposed rules being issued, the payment rules, inpatient, and, and the rest. So we're going to touch on a couple of different things that we thought might be relevant to, to, to get maybe to the top of your inbox, so to speak, um, as you're kind of working through that process and, and see what, um, what is going on. So from an agenda standpoint, we're going to start out with what we're just calling some reimbursement quick hits, which is what I'm going to hit. I wanted to touch a little bit on the OIG work plan, um, not that we're going to delve into any specifics related to provider relief funds in the CARES Act. I think there was another presentation or, or there's going to be another presentation on that. Um, but that is just one of the items that's a, that's a focus item. So I thought it'd be good just to touch on some things that the OIG is working on. Um, Glenn's going to talk to us about wage index and then the new rule that's just recently been issued related to medical education and the additional residency slots that are going to be um, in, uh, deployed around the country. And then we wanted to spend a little time on, on, on compensated care in, in DISH, not that anything new has come out in terms of the rule, because obviously the rule's not out, but there's been some activity on audits. I'd be curious to get some feedback from you all with, with regard uh, to that. And then we can wrap it up with um, some questions. So in terms of the, um, the reimbursement quick hits, um, what I wanted to just briefly touch on was refresh our memory a little bit on a couple of the items related to the IPVS final rule from last year. We're six, almost six months into, into the federal uh, fiscal year. And then I wanted to pivot from there and talk a little bit about um, what the prediction has been for 2023 and, and beyond. Um, and then a couple of more recent um, advocacy issues. I've got um, uh, some MedPAC testimony um, items to cover in here in anticipation that the report would be issued sometime in March and it was issued like a couple days ago so I read it you know the relevant parts on, on the plane on the way here so we, we can incorporate that um, into the discussion as, as well although it's not much different than the than the uh, than the testimony so from a refresher standpoint, for the year we're in now, at least for the inpatient system, rates were increased uh, right at 2.5%. That represented $3.7 billion before the adjustment was made to the uncompensated care pool. And the, and the pool actually went down over a billion four, which netted that down to, to 2.3 billion in additional payments through the inpatient system. And I'm bringing that up is because we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the outlook for 2023 and then what MedPAC just came out with in terms of what you might expect um, going forward and we can speculate about what's going to happen to the uncompensated care pool when we when we get to that section because we know we're still in the public health emergency CMS is likely to still continue to utilize data um, that was pre-pandemic um, to try to predict what will happen in in 2023, and, and um, there's been so, sort of an awkward situation in terms of employment and who's employed, and they're employed, but they, they may or may not have adequate health care coverage, but they're technically considered insured for the, for, the, for the calculation. And it's going to continue to move some pretty significant dollars, I, I think, around the country. Um, this is just a refresher on. You know, these were the base rates in, in place for uh, 2022. I think the total is right at about $6,600. Um, again, went up, went up 2%. Um, the expectation is that if, if inpatient rates go up another 2.5% like they did in 2022, then that 66 will grow to about $6,800 um, per case before adjusted for, uh, for case mix index. Um, the um, one of the, the and then of course um, they'll recalibrate the weights I put this slide in here because you may recall there was a provision um, to start reporting some information in the cost reports related to Medicare managed care and the idea was 
to incorporate that information into the calculation of the weights going forward. Um, you can't hear me. Um, sorry about that. Of the weights going forward, um, so that um, you can get a better picture of utilization for for all Medicare patients. And and the reason why that I think is still an issue to, to for us to watch is based on current information, Medicare Managed Care is now making up somewhere between 42 and 50 percent of Medicare's total business. And in fact, um, the expectation is it will go over 50 percent here in the, in the next couple of years. So more than half of Medicare patients are covered under this plan, but it's not really factored into the, the weight recalibration. And as you all know, many of the plan's payment contract with the hospitals is based off of Part A fee-for-service um, group or activity. So I don't think we've seen kind of the last of that. And then the last slide I just threw in here was uh, just to refresh everybody's memory on outliers. Um, outliers is still a pretty significant chunk of money paid to hospitals. And um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to that. Utilization obviously changed dramatically during the public health emergency, but the sickest Medicare patients still continue to go to the hospital. That those weren't elective <laughs> people, so it's going to be interesting to see how that how that kind of falls out. But then I wanted to, to talk a little bit about a 2023 and forward. I was on a call recently with a, a CFO of a startup, and I brought up the issue that the trustees report from last August now predicts that the trust fund, the, the Part A trust fund will run out of money by the end of 2026. And he said, oh, Mike, they've been talking about that for, for 20 years. And I said, yes, they have. But if you kind of notice, as the years have gone by, the amount of time between the report and when the fund is supposed to go insolvent has been shrinking. Um, and now we're only talking about five years from now. Even the CBO is, is estimating it ending in, um, uh, 2027. But this is a slide from the trustees report that just gives you a sense of how the dollars are being spent. And if you look at the total expenditures, just under the, the Part A column is $402 billion, $141 billion of which is going to the hospitals. But then go down a little bit further and, and, and look at the, um, the private health insurance Part C expenditure for both Part A and, and Part B. And if you go all the way to the last column, that's 317 billion out of 900, so a third of the dollars are are going to the to the Part C um, plans. So I wanted I wanted to, to highlight this. Here's just kind of the the first slide of the bad news, and you can see that in 2026 is the first time that the actual balance of the fund goes below zero. The slide I just showed you indicated that expenditures would exceed uh, tax revenues by $60 billion in 2023. And that will continue um, to happen. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, in a couple more slides. This is a, this is a particularly ugly one um, <laughs> because it's in graphical form and it just kind of drops off the table um, if, if something isn't, uh, isn't done. In terms of ex expenditures, if you look at the trustees report, it's anticipated that expenditures in 2023 will go up 15%. And that's both from a rate perspective plus an intensity perspective, um, as well as just the sheer volume of beneficiaries, because beneficiaries are growing exponentially as the baby boomers are, are entering the, um, the, the Medicare program, but that's 15% in 23, 6% in 24, another 6% in 25, and it's anticipated by 2030, expenditures will be up 73% compared to what they are in, in 2022. So this is continuing to be sort of a, a, a big issue to wrestle with. This uh, slide I won't talk much about other than you can get a sense of um, what's being what's being assumed in the in the report with regard to rates and you know the CPI for 2021 through 30 is 2.5 percent, but then you also look at the increase in beneficiaries and volume and intensity of services, and that's and you can start seeing rates going up over six and a half percent for for 2021 and 23. So there's going to be a lot of pressure upward upward pressure on this. So MedPAG um, 
gave testimony before a subcommittee of the Senate Finance Committee in, in February um, and estimated that Medicare spending will double in the next 10 years. Um, uh, and it, by 2020-31, it'll be $1.8 trillion, which will make up almost 19% of total federal spending. And then we also already talked about the the insolvency of the trust fund by 2026 based on C uh, CMS estimates and then 2027 based on CBO. So how do you fix that? And there's one or two or a combination of, of both things. The, the money to, to fund the trust fund comes from payroll tax dollars set currently at 2.9%. You can extend the you can extend the fund 25 years by increasing that from 2.9 percent to 3.7 percent, or you can reduce Part A spending by 19 percent, which is estimated to be 70 billion dollars in 2022, or you can do some combination of the two. And I'm putting it out there just because we're in that period of time when reports are coming out and you know, hospitals are speaking to their congressional delegations. There's a lot of pressure on, on a lot of things, supplementary money coming from other parts of the government that don't come through the trust fund. But this is a, a, a real issue. And, you know, there's a reckoning um, continuing to come. And then in terms of other aspects outside of inpatient acute, this was an alarming uh, uh, piece from the testimony. And this actually ended up in the MedPAC report that was issued a couple days ago, and that is that all these post-acute care programs are operating under unusually high margins. Now, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> if it's your margin, that's, <laughs> but that's the perception and that's the calculation that's, that's coming from Med, uh, MedPAC. So not only are they talking about not raising rates for skilled nursing facilities or, or home health or, or rehab or hospices, but actually rolling rates back compared to 2022. That's what they're recommending to Congress. That's not what the current um, that's not what the current law allows. But there's a lot of pressure on those um, programs. And again, Medicare Advantage. Um, the issue with Medicare Advantage is, and you can see that last bullet is. The, the, the payments that the program makes to the, to the carriers that run those programs is running at about 104% of Medicare fee-for-service expenditures. Um, and even though they expect it to smooth out over time with the reduction in utilization that occurred during the pandemic period, there was no downward adjustment to the, to the rates that were, were paid to the company. So that all went into the profit of the companies, the expectation is they'll come back out again now that you know hospitals are, are filling, filling back up. Um, but that I don't know that that's sustainable. And what's built into that 104% is also sort of a intensity creep of about 3.6% in MedPAC's estimation that we may hear about at some point in time, like we have on the, on the fee-for-service where we're getting a downward adjustment in each year's market basket update for um, what, what they're calling undocumented in intensity um, increases. And that's what this slide just kind of talks about the, the, the coding. Um, in terms of other advocacy, I don't know what you all have been in, involved in or, or what you're talking about with, with your congressional delegation, but the, the AHA has put out a couple of pieces recently um, one related additional provider relief funds. One is just to pay out the rest of the money that's been allocated that's not been uh, paid out. The other is to extend the, the, uh, the moratorium that's currently on the sequestration from April and get it to the, to the end of the year. Um, there's, also, um, uh, there's also advocacy on extending the period of time to repay the accelerated payments. I don't know where people stand with regard to, to repaying that money. Um, and we've talked to a lot of clients um, that have seen um, their utilization changes impact their Medicare DISH payment adjustment percentage such that um, it neg negatively impacted their qualification for the 340B. Um, discount program. There, 
there is something now in um, that was proposed just last week in the appropriations bill to try to do something about that for a short period of time, but um, there's not a, a huge amount of relief out there for hospitals that may lose their 340B uh, eligibility as a result of their um, dish percentage. And then I'll just touch briefly on the um, on the OIG um, work plan. There's going to be several aspects um, that they're digging into related to the provider relief funding. So you're not only subject to reporting and, and subject to auditing, but you all I know have read plenty of stories where dollars were issued or obtained or used in ways that they weren't intended by people is something that always happens when the government particularly hurriedly, hurriedly doles out money then the regulators come in on the back end to find out who all the bad actors were and then to figure out what happened and and what to do about it um, and those things, as you know, t tend to have a life of their own. So <laughs> once you start scratching that itch, as long as there's still a, an itch, the scratch will continue. And um, that can get pretty widespread and, and invasive um, on, on hospitals' part. They're also looking at um, doing some audits on MACs in terms of how they're processing and auditing um, cost reports, which is kind of interesting. Um, from the time they were intermediaries to the time that they're now max, over time we've gone from a period where there was a lot of ongoing audit activity to these now so-called desk reviews. Um, has that really gotten out of balance? Um, are things getting through in cost reports that maybe would get caught if there were more audits? Um, there are There is a, a lot of activity in uh, hospital construction, so there's, they're, they're going to do some work on, on claiming capital costs for new hospitals. The two midnight rule has come back up, so they, they did a lot of work, kind of went dormant for a while, now they're going to come back around and, and, and see, and then also look a little bit on these um, COVID payments, the, the additional payments that were made through HRSA. And, you know, the program, OIG or CMS, will not leave Medicare bad debts alone. I've been talking about Medicare bad debts, I think, for the whole 40 years <laughs> that I've been doing this. Um, they can't get legislation to do away with them, so they just keep trying to chip away at them um, through these kind of uh, programs. Um, and this may tie in a little bit with S10 in that they're spending, CMS and the MACs are spending a lot more time looking at providers policies and procedures and determining whether you're following your own rules. And if you're not following your own rules, then it's going to negatively impact some of these uh, reimbursement dollars going forward. So um, I hate to start out the presentation on, on that note, but I thought it's, it, this is a good time to kind of take the temperature of some things that are going on, some big things as, as you're talking to people that come to visit you know, the hospitals. With that, we'll get a little bit more granular and turn it over to Glenn and talk about wage index. All right. Thanks, Mike. Let's see if the mic works here. Uh, you know, in terms of wage index, I could probably easily spend an hour talking about wage index, but this is supposed to be just hot topics. And so what is it in terms of wage index that's important? And so I have a slide here that really kind of sets forth how the wage index plays into the Medicare payment. And the one thing to always keep in mind is that your Medicare payment and other payments, the wage index plays a role of about 90% of, of your revenue stream. So wage index is not only is it used for Medicare, for the hospitals, it also plays a role and, and is a payment um, component for all the non-hospital entities uh, like like skilled nursing and rehab and psych. And then if you take it a step further, some of the Medicaid plans are using the wage index. Like in California, um, they, they use the wage index values of Medicare to come up with the Medicare, to come up with the Medi-Cal payment in that state. Um, so it has, fought, you know, the wage index has kind of a, a wide reach, so to speak. And it's, it's really important, you have to keep on top of it uh, year after year, uh, because um, you know, if you if you don't, you're just hurting your revenue stream. So, um, in terms of of how has the wage index factor played out over time? Um, a couple years ago, Congress, uh, you know, they they came to the realization that 
hospitals that, that have, I'll say, a high compensation base are rewarded under this system, and hospitals that have a low compensation base um, are penalized. So what that means is hospitals that are, you know, for the most part are located on the two coasts, the, the west coast and the east coast, they seem to make out a little bit better than hospitals that are located in the middle of, of the nation. So they put forth um, this, this low wage index policy um, that started a couple years ago. And basically, it's, in my view, it's, it's kind of like um, Robin Hood, right? We're going to take from the rich and give to the poor. And that's, that's you know, that concept is, is in play, and it's been in play for a couple years. And to be honest, I think it's going to continue to be in play. Um, because you, we don't want our hospitals to fail or our healthcare providers to fail um, nationwide. We want to keep everybody viable. So um, they set caps on the hospitals that have high wage index values, and they, um, they give that money to the hospitals that have the lower wage index values. Uh, there's litigation out there that is fighting against this, uh, but I think there's probably more people that are in favor of this policy, this low wage index policy, um, than, than people that are fighting it. But just want to keep you aware that there is litigation and this, this could change. Uh, there's no end date right now. This is really something that's put forth based off of CMS's discretion. And that's why there's litigation, is anytime CMS says, well, we have the discretion to do this, um, attorneys will come in and they'll say, no, you don't, and then that, leads to, to the litigation. Also, wage index values are developed um, based upon geographic lines. And a lot of those geographic lines are, are developed from county lines. Um, the OMB has taken a look at this. They, they looked at this um, at the beginning of last year and reached a decision, this committee reached a decision that the lines, the geographic lines that are set up uh, were set up so long ago, and they should be re-looked at. And what they came up with was a, a list of six recommendations. But the, the one that stands out to me the most is, is number one, where the, the uh, urban areas were set up under the premise that you're an urban area if you have, 50, 000, if you have a population of 50,000 or more. And the, the committee is recommending that we increase that to 100,000. So what's going to happen over time is when these recommendations are finally adopted and implemented is you're going to have a few less large urban areas. And what that will probably mean is that those, those um, urban areas that once qualified at 50,000 um, and are now not going to qualify because they don't have 100,000, uh, they're probably going to uh, move into maybe a, a, an, a rural area or, or something along those lines. We have to kind of see how this plays out. But I just want to let everybody know that, that there are going to be changes to the geographic makeup that we've all gotten used to over time um, related to how the wage index is, is formed together. Uh, they're also, number four, they're also going to start to look at this on an annual basis. Um, and they're going to start with, with the, uh, you know, imp implementing the 2020 census that, that um, um, you know, we all, we all uh, responded to in 2020. So under their recommendation, you would have three sets of updates. One is an annual update, which sometimes there may not be an update. Um, and then every five years, there will be an update, and then you'll have the 10-year update. So I think the every five year update is really the important one um, on this slide because that's where they're gonna, you're probably gonna see the most changes in, is every five years. Um, the 10 year update is the same as the five year, it's just gonna have the, the, the 10 year census update to it. And they released a schedule in terms of when this is going to take effect. Um, the first update is gonna happen in June of next year. So June of 20, uh, 23, and then from there, we have annual updates in December of, of every year, and then finally a five-year update, and then back to an annual update. Also, um, there, were, there were some inc uh, some changes to the geographic reclass process. Uh, this uh, went into effect, it's in effect now, 
uh, and it, this had to do with how the average hourly wage was computed for geographic reclasses. So in the past, uh, we've, had, we've had providers that have, um, you know, they might be part of an urban area, but for various reasons, they reclassify to a rural area. And when it came to geographic reclass, what CMS would do in the past is they would compare your average hourly wage to your home geographic area. And there was some litigation on this. Um, it's, the, it's the Bates case. And uh, basically, um, hospitals successfully challenged that, that process. And they said, look, we're paid. Um, this, our particular hospital is paid as a rural area. So our average hourly wage should be compared to the rural areas, not our home geographic area. And the hospitals were successful in that case. Um, and the government did not appeal it. So the rule now is, for, for the most part, the way I view it is the rule is, is that um, your geographic uh, reclass, your average hourly wage calculation or test is now developed uh, from the area where you're paid from, not so much where you're geographically located. So consequently, if, if an urban hospital reclassifies as rural, its eligibility to, to geographically reclass will be determined based upon a comparison of its average hourly wage to the average hourly wages of the hospital located in the rural area of the, st of the state. Uh, this went into effect on September 1st of 2021, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that's permanent in my view. I put together, or I, I'm using, I guess I'm reusing our, our timeline. A lot of these dates uh, have passed, but the timeline is relevant from the standpoint that uh, this is your wage index uh, timeline that CMS issues every year. Um, you know, the tasks that are, that are written there um, are pretty, pretty much the same from year to year. The dates change a little bit. So, you know, September 2nd kicked off the, the period when um, uh, the wage index was, was gonna be uh, corrected, right? You had to get all your corrections in by that date. And then from September 2nd to November 4th, you had your deadline uh, to where that, that uh, data was reviewed. And then from there, um, uh, it was sent to CMS. It's transmitted to CMS. So in late January uh, of this year, CMS releases that data and gives us another opportunity to look at it. And then there's a short two-week period where if you look at that data and it doesn't match exactly to what you expected it to be, uh, you can appeal it. So that, that deadline was February 15th. Uh, you're not allowed to include any additional data that you would have been required to include by September 2nd. This is just, you know, if the data was, was mishandled or not transmitted correctly, um, that's, what, that's what you appeal. Um, and then we're, you know, we're kind of getting now towards the tail end. Uh, of this process, uh, March 18th, which I guess is tomorrow. Uh, that would be the deadline for the MAX to transmit that final wage index data. And then there's other deadlines uh, in April where you can still continue to appeal. So if you're still dissatisfied, you can go through this appeal process. But the idea is to take everybody's data and whittle it down so that at the end, by the time we get into April, there should only be a handful of providers that if any, that are gonna be dissatisfied with the data. But the data is then taken and it's used in the um, establishment of the, of the wage index values in the proposed rule that comes out at the end of April and again later in the final rule that comes out um, uh, in August. So, you know, there's a, it, it's, it's a year-long process in terms of, of wage index data and, you know, uh, making sure it's, it's correct and again, Remember, 90% of all of your payment uh, related to Medicare ties in somehow to the wage index data. So it's very, very important that that data be monitored. Uh, in terms of GME, um, you know, I've been in this business for probably too long, and I can remember back in the 1990 period, I think it was like 96, where they set caps on on GME. In fact, I can go back and think about where in IME, on the IME side, they used to have a process, believe it or not, where you could, there would be one day 
every year where whoever was in your hospital on that day, you count one FTE and that's how your IME payment was developed for the entire year. And that, that day was September 1st. So you can imagine how everybody is scrambling to make sure that on that particular day, all those residents are in your facility so you can count them and get, get paid for IME. But um, that, that has long since gone and they set up caps, right? So CMS wants to, you know, they wanna kind of control the residency um, uh, costs, right, that they're, that they're incurring. So they set up caps in 1996 and nothing has really happened uh, since that time to change caps. I mean, there's been a little bit of, of, of give and take on that, but, but not, not, um, not anything measurable in terms of like reestablishing or resetting caps. So the hospital community has, has been very vocal about the fact that, that, um, you know, that we need to have some cap relief. And so uh, CMS said, okay, we will give you some cap relief, but nothing is free. So here's what we're going to do. We're gonna allow you some cap relief if you agree to train more residents going forward. So if you're willing to incur the cost of training residents going forward uh, and you follow our rules, you will get some cap relief from that. So I don't know that that's sitting too well with, with folks. I mean, there, there are, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of programs that are well over their cap, right? And so, you know, I talk to different people and, and once I explain it to them that, hey, you, you know, nothing's free, right? You, they want, they're gonna give you something, but you have to give something as well. And what CMS really wants to do is they wanna train more physicians in rural areas. That's what's kind of behind this Appropriations Act of 2021. So it was signed into law in, uh, on December 27th, 2020. Uh, we thought we would see instructions on how to implement this and time kind of went on and went on and went on. And, and here we get to um, uh, the day before Christmas December 24, 2021, and uh, CMS releases uh, this this uh, um, this final rule, which which sets forth the the law and how they're going to administer it. Um, and what it says is is they're going to allow you um, some additional FTEs, um, five FTEs per hospital or per year per hospital over a five-year period. Uh, there's going to be some changes if you operate within a rural training or rural track program. Um, and then finally, if you have a low per resident amount or you have a low cap number, we're going to give you some relief. Um, and these changes, they're referred to uh, primarily in sections 126, 127, and 131. So I'll talk about each one of these. Uh, section 126 is the additional residency slots. Um, and this makes available 1,000 FTE resident slots, and it's gonna be, again, phased in uh, 200 slots per year over five years. Uh, the important deadline is coming up. It's March 31st, uh, so this is your, your first deadline, um, and I presume that March 31st will be the date every year for the next five years. Uh, if you want to increase and add residency slots, that's the date you have to keep in mind. Um, and there's an application process. Um, they're going to distribute 200 slots, uh, and then the notice of this award will be uh, later this year or early next year with an effective date of July 1st of 2023. Um, they set up some, some criteria in terms of getting these additional slots, and they're set forth there in the bullet points. Um, you know, if you're a hospital located in rural area and you're you're treated as, as being in a rural area by, by CMS, um, that's, that's, you know, that, that's good that you meet that criteria. Uh, or number two, let's say you're, you're training residents that are, um, you're over your cap. So you could be in any area and be over your cap and, and that would qualify you for this. Um, there's hospitals located in 35 states which have new medical schools um, or additional locations. Uh, that might be applicable to you, so that you could qualify that way. Um, and then finally, uh, hospitals that train residents in a program where at least 50% of all residents' training time occurs at a site physically located in a HIPSA area. 
And I've, I've worked, I work with different hospitals, and you know, some hospitals only qualify under the first bullet, some qualify under bullet two and four, but the, the key is, is you have to qualify under one of those four uh, bullets. But the key here really is once, once you qualify and you put your application in, your HIPSA score will be used to prioritize all applications. So I, I have some um, providers that have the highest HIPSA score of, of 25, and I have another provider on the top of my head here that, that has a HIPSA score of 14. So, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you have that low HIPSA score, odds are you may not receive any, any FTE cap right or any relief because uh, you're at the bottom. But like what I always say is that, you know, if you want to get a hit, you got to get up to bat and swing the bat. That's the only way to know for sure. So, um, so just because you might have a low HIPSA score doesn't mean you shouldn't you should give up. Just go ahead and put put you know, put your um, hat in the ring and see what happens. Um, additional facts here: hospitals can only apply for one residency program in a given year. Um, you're limited to a maximum of one slot per program year. Um, and there's, this is where things get a little bit uh, wonky. You'll have to go back and look at your programs and what you operate and, um, and that sort of thing. But um, you know, the, the fourth bullet there, a hospital must meet one or more of the four priority categories to apply for a slot. Um, and then there's some additional uh, links here in terms of additional information. It's not, it's not easy, right, to interpret how they did this. They made it very complex. So if you're thinking about adding uh, residents, you have to go through all these steps and, and really, uh, really look through them. But um, again, the applications, um, they're all going to be prioritized based off of your HIPSA rating plus uh, um, other criteria. Uh, the highest scores will be a lot of the slots first. Um, hospitals with less than 250 beds will have priority within the HIPSA score range. Um, you know, you have to commit. That, that's what it gets down to, is if you're going to do the application and go through it, uh, you just have to commit uh, to it. So kind of in summary, what you have to think about is, first of all, does this even apply to your, to your hospital? Are you over your caps? Or, or not, do you, are, you, you know, are you located in a rural area? What's your HIPSA score? Um, there's only 200 FTEs per, you know, allowed per year. They will, they will fulfill that. I'm pretty confident that there's enough interest. Uh, some hospitals are, are like, you know, I don't know that I wanna make the financial commitment either. That's the other thing. It's, there's, there's a financial, financial commitment to do this. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, rural track program, so this is section 127. Um, again, CMS, they, what they want to do is they want to encourage more physicians being trained in rural settings. They really want to beef that up. And so in this section 127, uh, th there were some, some requirements that had to do with accreditation, so they've set forth a new definition there. Um, and then you know, there's also this, this idea that you might uh, be an urban hospital as a hub, but as a spoke, you, those, you might have, have residents that go and they might train in a rural area for a certain amount of time. And so I think if you're, if you're urban and you're in that hub and spoke um, setup, I'll say, you, you're actually in a pretty good position uh, to, to take advantage of Section 127. Uh, there, there also is a change in terms of the rolling average. Um, there, there was kind of a, what I want to say, it's kind of a, a dis, uh, like a disincentive, I'll, I'll say, in terms of the rolling average calculations, because the first year, some of these, some of these people that were in the in the rural tracks, they weren't getting counted in that in that first year. Um, so they've they've, um, um, you know, they made some changes there. And then uh, rural hospitals with established programs can now take advantage of, of the RTP uh, cap adjustment, just like their urban uh, hospital counterparts. And uh, um, the documentation requirements for identifying the additional FTEs and the amount of training time in all five uh, program years at both the, uh, 
the urban and the rural setting uh, since, since these are established is, is really a key, a key factor in this. But there are, cha there are remaining challenges, right? So the first question that, that you'd have to ask is, is it advantageous to be uh, separately accredited? So that's only something that you could answer uh, internally. Um, the five-year cap allocation, it still favors urban hospitals. And so since, um, you know, so what happens is since you have the more resident time being spent at the urban place in, the, in program year one, this ends up assigning more cap to the urban hospitals than hospitals will use like in a mature 666 program and, um, and less to the rural hospital than, than its future uh, claimed residents. Um, affiliation agreements are, are kind of a big thing. So hospitals that participate in a, in a non-rural track program residency, um, they can adjust to use their cap values for the Medicare affiliation agreements. But unfortunately, if you're in a rural track program, cap adjustments are not currently eligible to be shared uh, through Medicare affiliation agreements. So there's some unintended consequences here. CMS is still looking at, at making corrections uh, to this. And then finally, uh, section 131. This has to do with hospitals that receive, or, or I should say have a low per resident amount um, or a low FTE cap. There's a reset process. So it allows you to reset your per resident amounts um, and also reset uh, uh, your, your caps basically and so they break it up into different sections here so you have your you have what's called the old teaching hospitals or category a and these are for teaching hospitals uh, that be that had these low per resident amounts and low caps set um, before October of 1997 and so if your PRA or your cap was less than if your PRA yeah PRA and cap it um, was set based off of a an FTE count that's less than one, then if you commit to growing your program, you can get your, your um, PRA and FTE cap reset. And then similarly, category B is a newer hospital and all it is is it's just by date. So anything after October of, of 97 through January of 2021, um, it's the same process. If you make that commitment, um, you know, you, you can get your, your PRA and FTE cap reset. The only difference is, is that the, the value is different. It's, it's less, if you have less than three FTE, then you can get a reset. Um, the window closes in 2025, so you have to keep that in mind uh, going forward. I have a hospital that um, they have an FTE cap of two. I think, they, I think that's how it works out. Um, or they're capped at two. So you, they thought initially they might qualify here, but if you go into, the, into their cost report, what actually happened is their FTE cap got set at 10. And then there was a change somewhere along the way where they had a reduction. So CMS took away some of that cap. They took away eight. So now their cap is two. And so they were pretty disappointed because they said, hey, we're only getting paid based off of two. We should qualify. And I said, no, no, you have to go back to 1996. What was your starting cap? And that's, that's the value you need to look at. Um, so if you're familiar with the Medicare cost reports, it's that very first line on E-4 that shows your GME uh, FTE cap. That's, that's what you have to compare against, not what CMS has, has taken away or given you over time. Um, the other thing would be is if you're, they, they consider, hospitals that uh, don't have an, a, a per resident amount or don't have a, a cap currently um, as a virgin hospital. That's how they're referring to it. So um, you're going to remain in that status, but you have to be aware of what's going on with FTEs uh, or residents, I should say, in your, in your facility. So if you have residents um, that are, you know, going to be reported or, or something new is happening, you gotta keep track of that because even though today if you have zero, so you have a zero FTE cap, you have a zero per resident amount, but you're starting a new, a new program, you have to be aware of how that interacts with this section 131. 
And probably the most scary one is, is the unpaid FTEs, right? Sometimes facilities have FTEs that rotate in that aren't paid. Um, and maybe you have a reimbursement department and you don't even know that this is happening. You have to try to figure out, you know, communicate and try to figure out, okay, um, do we have any, any free uh, residents that are coming in? Because even though you don't report them on your cost report, they could still be identified in some other way and that could end up setting, um, unfortunately, setting a cap and a per resident amount for you. So of, of everything that's in 131, the one, the one area that I get the most concerned about is the unpaid FTEs or the, you know, the FTEs that you don't really know about because you know how it is, you, you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. And that's, this, this kind of falls into that, that last category. Um, other implement, implementation considerations. Uh, so if, if you want to reset your, your per resident amount, so we've, you know, you qualify, let's say, that to, for a reset, uh, you have until July 1st of this year to, to uh, submit that request. And again, it's an application, so you have to go ahead and, and do it. Um, the, the MAC is not going to do it for you, so you have to take the initiative and, and do that. So I have a recap, you know, there's a lot of information in this area, but I have a recap slide here that, that tries to sum everything up in terms of what, what we um, just talked about. And so, you know, at some point, if, if this is of interest to you or applicable to you, what I would say is go through these slides and look at this recap um, and see if any of this applies uh, to you. Um, like I said, I had the one hospital that thought it applied and then upon reconsideration they found out that, that it didn't really apply. But again, this is just, you know, this is, this is where we're at. CMS says, yeah, we'll give you some cap relief, but we need that commitment from you to help grow and meet our needs as well. So with that, I will turn it back over to Mike and we'll talk about uncompensated care. Perfect. Thank you, Glenn. Um, We've got a, a little bit left here, so we'll, we'll kind of sort of move through this. Um, this is just sort of a level set um, where we are this year. As you can see in 2021, we were over $8.3 billion still in this uncompensated care pool fund. We talked earlier that it dropped significantly in, in 2022, so this is something to watch. If Even in 2022, though, if, if, if you add the uncompensated care pool back to the empirically justified dish that you get reimbursed through the cost report, the sum of those equals to what DISH was under the old formula about 10 years ago. So it's kind of, it's come, it's come full circle. But this is a typical scenario where if you give CMS the ability to adjust the levers, they will adjust the levers to try to get the, the funding to, to, to fit what they need. So um, you, we've seen a steady drop over the last several years. So it will be interesting to see what comes up this year. I've got a couple of slides I wanted to talk about um, just real quickly, the audits that have been going on and the, and the fact that there's, there's still a lot of volatility in these numbers nationally. Um, and because it's a new set every year, a new crop of problems can, can come up in what's being reported by hospitals. And they're pretty significant swings. So this is based on the 2018 audits which are the data of which is incorporated in the numbers that the hospitals are being paid today. The 2019 audits that hospitals went through that finished up at the end of last year is what will be included in the proposed rule that comes out in April. And then um, the 2020 audits have already begun for most of the providers in the country. I don't think it's really um, hit out here yet. but. In this particular slide, um, what this is showing that <clears throat> if you compare the cost reports before the audit and after the audit, the line 30 value that drives the distribution of the dollars dropped $1.3 billion. So that's a pretty big number. Um, e even if you consider the whole base, it's still a pretty big number of findings within hospital cost reports to, to move dollars around. And if, you, and if you look at, from a, a charity standpoint, what made that up, um, the, the biggest part of it came from insured charity. And I can tell you from the work that we do in this area, 
This is, believe it or not, a difficult number for hospitals to get to um, in, their, in the new patient accounting systems. And the reason why this is so important is this is a, a segment of the program where th this is not subject to the cost to charge ratio. So this is like a dollar for dollar deal on line 30 that drives the allocation. Um, and they don't necessarily automatically go back over to the, to the uninsured charity. So this, there's still a lot of findings in this area, which means they'll continue to still dig in this area. Um, and we know of a lot of hospitals in this last round, the 2019 round, started getting management letters from Max with deficiencies that they identified during the audit, which then puts the onus on the hospital truly to have to do something with it or determine whether or not they can claim similar patients in the, in the future, depending on the deficiency that was outlined in the management letter. So what you're seeing is we went from no audits to auditing about 25% of the people hospitals to auditing 100% of the hospitals to now actually issue in management letters. So the, so the, the, the price to pay keeps, keeps going up. Um, this was probably the biggest kicker. Um, in, the, in the first couple rounds of audits, there was literally no work being done on bad debts at all. Um, one MAC did do some work and has some significant findings that was shared across the MAC community and now all MACs are, are doing significant work in, in bad debts. And you can see here the change in bad debts was over $3 billion in this last round of audits. And what the MACs are starting to look at more and more is, you know, are you following your own collection policies? And, and then there's a cross up between what should be claimed for charity versus what should be claimed for, um, for bad debt. And this is not Medicare bad debt. This is non-Medicare non bad debt. So this will continue to be a, a, a focus item. This is just some data from the Washington and the Alaska hospitals. This is public information, so I'm not telling tales out of school. But it gives you an opportunity to at least look at the national numbers and then look at, the, look at your geographic area and sort of see if it's ebbing and flowing based on what you would expect, which is really the change in, in the pool. So if you take Washington, for instance, the, line, the actual line 30 went up. But funding actual payments went down almost 14%, but the pool went down 13%. So all of the things being equal, you would have expected some reduction if there wasn't any a, a change in your percentage of uncompensated care to total. But when we look at hospitals, that's what we're looking for is, wh what are the numbers doing relative to the overall program? And is your piece of the pie on a percentage basis still sort of consistent? Um, going forward. And then I'm going to wrap up with a, with a couple here. Um, sort of the big story was um, new requirements were put in place to report Medicare dish days, charity days, and non-Medicare bad debt days that, that came out of a Paperwork Reduction Act rule that was scheduled to go in effect that, at the, it, that was Transmittal 17 for the cost report at, in the 11th hour. Um, CMS elected not to implement it and to go ahead and reissue it with a new comment period in what's going to be called Transmittal 18, which has not yet been issued. So be on the lookout for that. If you haven't spent much time on this, I would encourage you to go back and look, look at it because the reporting requirements that were included in that rule were very onerous. Um, and and if, you're, if you are working with the audits and you work through a sort of a reconciliation of an account from total charges to zero balance, um, and you only had to do it for five patients or 10 patients or 15 patients, because that's what the audit sample was, and you had difficulty accomplishing that, imagine what that's gonna be like if you have to do that for 2,500 patients or 3,500 patients, because that's what this, the exhibit required hospitals to do. So. I would definitely stay focused on this and, and weigh in from a comment standpoint. Um, at the end of the day, the juice has got to be worth the squeeze. I mean, the, the regulators are in charge of, of regulating, but you can overregulate and create so much additional work um, for you. So these, these next series of slides really just sort of cover that. Um, there's one outstanding issue that's going on with regard to the SSI ratios that has to do with a case that was won in the Ninth Circuit that affects this part of the country that was just heard before the, or right, I think it was right after the first of the year before the Supreme Court. Um, and the expectation is we'll have a decision 
that'll come out sometime this summer that will shape the way these so-called dual eligible exhausted days are, are counted, whether they're counted in the for the dish calculation in the SSI ratio or the the Medicaid fraction, and that's this Empire Health um, Foundation case. Um, the only thing I'm going to say about the audits, the, the new round of audits have begun for most of the country. The audit letter reads pretty much the same in this round as it did in the last round, so if you were involved in it, you can expect more or less the, the, the same thing to happen. Um, the templates on how they want the data reported have changed a little bit. And I think they're doing, um, um, you can tell from this slide, I think they're doing a little bit more work up front before they actually select the sample of patients and submit it. So they're getting a little better idea of how your policy is working and are you actually um, following your policy. So I think with that, I think we're right at time. I don't know if we have a lot of time or any time really for questions or less. Yeah, so we can throw it open if there's anything. I came, I came in a little late. Was there anything, any updates on rural referral centers? Um, I didn't have anything. No, uh, we did not uh, say anything did you on have rural a specific referral centers. <laughs> well, I, I just, I know you talked about the changes in the urban reclassification and more and that different thresholds changing, right? And so it got me thinking whether those that were in urban areas, if that affects the rural, uh, referral classification or not. So, well, I think that those geographic when they you could probably do when they implement yeah. those the the new delineations that that could have an impact. It could, it could. Um, you know, we kind of have to see how those geographic delineations uh, come out. But I can tell you that folks are looking at um, you know doing r rural uh, rural referral center status so that they can qualify for geographic reclassifications. They're, folks look at that all the time. So uh, it is something to, to consider once the new geographic lines come out. Any other questions, anyone? No? Okay. Well, thank you again for your time. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you both very much. We appreciate your time.